I'd like to say uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the speakers, who, many of whom have actually come from uh, a fair way away to be at today's uh, presentation. And not least, I'd like to thank, before we begin, the European Union for funding the Selector Project, which is sponsoring today's event. Uh, and um, uh, today's program really does bring experts from across Europe uh, to give you a, a summary of what's happening in terms of whole life, uh, life cycle uh, costing and life cycle assessment. The structure of the program is such that we hope that by the time you leave today, you'll have an understanding of the principles of life cycle assessment and life cycle costing, as well as an understanding of, of um, how, how these principles are actually implemented uh, through a series of actual construction projects. Uh, I would encourage you to visit the demonstration of the software that's been developed by the Selector project um, in the basement where coffee was served. Um, this will be available over coffee and over lunch, and we'll give you uh, a summary of the software which can be um, used to, to, to assist um, projects in terms of life cycle costing and life cycle assessment. I'm conscious today is actually quite busy. You've got seven presentations. Um, each of the speakers I've asked to spend no more than 25 minutes presenting. At the end of each of the presentations, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions. There's then a further opportunity for you at the end of the uh, day for, uh, to ask uh, questions of the panel of all the people who've presented today. So I'm conscious that uh, we are on quite a tight timetable. So what I will do with that now is to begin by introducing uh, Andrew Green, who's our keynote speaker today. Uh, Andrew is director of uh, Faithful and Gould, uh, which is part of the Atkins Group. Uh, he's head of the uh, whole life value and life cycle asset management practice within uh, Faithful and Gould, and is a leading practitioner and expert on lifetime <coughs> costings for construction uh, projects and portfolio asset management. So with that, Andrew. Good morning, Good morning ladies and gentlemen. And it's great to see you to our audience. Um, I'm going to cover more of a high-level overview of um, approach to life cycle costing. Um, the other speakers, I'm sure, are going to go into more technical detail if you look at the agenda. Um, I'm going to pitch this from the life cycle in a business pragmatic way and share some experiences for large organizations, how they've actually embraced life cycle asset management thinking to improve the project delivery, to enhance the way they operate as a business, and to really make sure the value is achieved in the way they're making decisions. That's a pretty broad church, so it's about the balance of not just costs, but risk, performance, and how that affects the way in which it operates in construction, as well as in the retained estate. I'm going to give some examples from some major players in different sectors, and I'm also pleased to see that the appetite for doing this has significantly changed, probably for wrong reasons, the austere times are in, every penny counts, and clearly there's business sense in using life cycle in the most appropriate way. But also I want to give you some good news to kick off with, which some of you may or may not be aware of. We're all comfortable in capital costing because since 1922 we've had rules and measurement for how to do construction cost planning. But if you actually think about it, we're all trying to do life cycle costing without the rules for doing maintain, replace, and some of the other more complex elements of energy and operating costs in a standardized, industry-accepted way. There's a number of initiatives have taken place, but I'm pleased to announce that since 1922, there was a development back in the 90s, you may be aware of, where the maintenance industry developed specifications for maintaining the heating and ventilation contract association it didn't go quite far enough because it doesn't cover all the building elements and all of the services items. SIPSI have done some significant work in life cycling along with BRE and various other groups, BCIS and others, in terms of how to life assets and in 19, uh, 2005 the standard method of measurement for construction was actually produced which is obviously a significant document in its own right. What's interesting on April the 24th this year we managed to get the RICS, the BCS, to agree to change their data structure to line up with the maintenance industry and with the life in work going on by SIPSI, BISRI and other people so to link a data structure, build, maintain, replace. And on, in addition to that, the HBCA changed the name to Building an Engineering Service Association and now provide maintenance specifications for every maintainable asset. 
is now a full set, not half a story. Now, this is important if we're going to help life cycle to be practically done in a more consistent and more robust way. The news yet to come out is that in about two to three months' time, the Royal Institute of Chart Surveyors, along with SIBSI, will be amending the standard method of measurement. I know because I've helped to offer it. And the SIBSI guide is amending all the life in and comprehensively updating it to link to the RLCS rules. So these professions have collaborated to bring standards that bring a join up, build, maintain, replace. And the Institute has also upped its game in terms of maintenance that can be available and tailored to different situation sectors and, and uh, budgets, etc. And then, also to round this off, the British standards are, in, are going to be issuing BS 8544, which is a guide to operating and maintaining buildings in the in-use phase, which also is a pretty important, helpful standard coming out in, in two or three months' time. So the world of life cycle costing has been given a big leg up. But let's not get sort of too into that. Let's speak more about how do we use this in practice to the benefit of all those involved in the process. Just to sort of elaborate on that for a second, the RLCS rules of measurement, you can see there, is actually on the, the website. So they've now linked maintenance standards to how you build and maintain buildings, how you cost manage them through the BCS, and now in sync, and what's called uh, new rules of measurement three, how to operate and maintain and measure building maintenance has been done. And that's now been launched on the 14th of November last year. So that's just really helpful um, foundation blocks for doing life cycle costing in a more effective way. I'm Andy Green, as kindly introduced. I'm a practitioner, but I've also had a hand in writing these standards, which is a fantastic way of working with experts and making a practical standard. It's been a, a pleasure and a privilege to be involved in. And the second standards and the third set I've been talking about, I'm really here today to talk about how do they get used in practice. Also, to just clarify, there's confusion around whole life costs, life cycle costs. I'm sure the other speakers will dwell on this in more detail. But the new standards make it much clearer. We're building, maintaining, replacing. We are including operating costs, end of life costs, and environmental costs. And we will go to more wider whole life costs if income, externalities, and non construction costs are considered in the equation. That diagram is now pivotal to the appropriate cost structure for build, maintain, replace, and the wider life cycle and whole life um, um, cost structure and benchmarking. But again, that's just helping to clarify the difference between the two. Moving on, balanced approach. A number of years ago, the government mandated that we should consider all construction projects on best value, not lowest capital cost. I'm still concerned, and I'm sure many share this view, that too many decisions are still capex driven. Not whole life, not taking account of quality of the build, the, uh, the way in which it functions, and the sustainability aspects, as that statement says, which is relevant to the stakeholders' projects' requirements. So what I'm going to talk about for the balance of my minutes is how to actually get a better decision-making, value-driven approach using life cycle principles in a whole life thinking way. The good news is, this is happening already and has been in certain sectors for years. Those of you from the highways industry, this is embedded in the way in which they think. It always makes you chuckle driving down the fast lane. If they don't take life cycle crossing seriously, I dread to see a pothole in the fast lane of a motorway. I would personally have a bit of a worry if they weren't doing life cycle seriously. The good news is they do, and there's an awful lot of good learning that's taking place in how they're projecting the, the life cycle and how they actually do their denigration models and detailed what-if scenarios, what spec to choose, how easy to access and re-maintain, impact on the environment, limiting congestion. All of those factors are being considered in a more balanced approach. And I leave you to sort of do it on that. They're not alone. Network Rail and the rail industry are doing great work as well on projecting when to actually maintain, when to renew, how best to optimise that, how best to then upgrade the stations to look after them and also commercialise them for income streams from other things on the platform. So there's a whole host of discussions taking place on life cycle management, whole life value of the estates. And they're not stopping there. Energy, obviously in the nuclear industry, a massive issue about decommissioning and how whole life is considered from the inception through to the ultimate surrender of the asset. Defence estates, massively into through life costing, those of you in that sector will be aware of that. 
and housing's done some massive amounts of work on whole life cost modelling and uh, it's a serious investment to help get better decision making on build, maintain and life cycle factors. I've personally been involved in three of the largest airports in the UK in the last three months and I'm heartened by the commitment from the top table, from the directors of the companies, to seriously drive out operating costs. No surprise, they're clearly your business, they're regulated. Why wouldn't you want to be more efficient and reduce your operating costs as well as the, your burden on renewal planning? But they're ultimately there to support the customer. So their decisions are very much driven by those four key drivers. Will the customer experience or passenger experience be better? And if not, why are we you know, not uh, doing something to make the asset uh, perform in that way? Is it efficient for the airlines that operate in terms of how they manage the asset? And are they resilient and sustainable in the way they conduct themselves in a life cycle asset management way? And those are true to all the operators of all the airports. We know that because Heathrow and Manchester and others have joined forces to try to get the optimum way of life cycle managing their estate. And I'll share with you a few examples of how they've achieved that. They've done that in a cost, they've done that in a benefit to their, their purpose in life, which is to support passengers being moved through the airport, getting baggage onto planes, and to make sure the planes are taken off. So their real business focus is moving baggage people and planes. And how well they do that is obviously the bit you can never quite you know, finish the journey, but there's obviously lots of improvements and efficiencies that could be achieved if you do that in a certain life cycle way. So I'm really pleased to say they have taken the, the bug, if you want to call it that, in terms of managing their asset from a, a life cycle optimising point of view. How do I acquire, build, maintain, replace and dispose of my assets, whether they're air bridges, whether they're boilers, in the way that's the best buy, in the way that makes the biggest benefit to the operation cost, in the way that impacts on the customer experience. Therefore it's linked to the business purpose in a more balanced and a more focused way. That has to be right, and clearly there's a lot of energy going into how to do that. And I'm sure everyone in this room would not step foot on a plane if he felt that the engine and all the fun fundamental parts weren't being properly looked after from a safety and maintenance and performance point of view. So clearly the airline have got a lot of good uh, things that they've done in the past, and it's fundamental that we take life cycle seriously. And that's really just a clarity. Now in terms of the approach they're adopting, they are thinking life cycle, from acquiring or creating an asset through to designing it and actually operating it, maintaining and refurbishing it or replacing it and through to disposal, retiring the asset and all the other issues and doing that in a way that balances cost, risk and performance and when is the right time to intervene and spend money on the asset, buying a new one or refurbishing it to keep it going. Now there's a little sort of example of that. Terminal 1, as you may or may not know, is being closed in 2016. So some of the assets are getting a bit aged out. Now strategy-wise, why would you throw good money after something that's being turned off in a few years' time? You will sweat the asset. So the simple logic is, knowing what the location and the business plan is for their asset portfolio drives the life cycle thinking that then helps to inform the right option to be assessed. Other parts of the airport are here for 20, 30, 40 more years. They then invest in, and their appropriate life cycle planning is tailored to their business outlook, their future proofing. And that's making life cycle embedded and integrally part of the way in which they manage that, that, that portfolio. They're looking to then also make sure they understand how do we own and operate, how do we best buy, how do we do this in a through life thinking way, not just doing another round of projects and doing the projects on time, on budget. That is not where they are at now. They have made a mental shift to move to actually managing the life cycle of the asset, not just being great at doing projects. I think we'll all agree that Heathrow has done some pretty good projects in the past. So that's where the thinking is, which I believe is relevant to every organisation, every sector. The issue is where do you put the energy and the focus so you're not trying to do everything of equal importance. A balanced view is what's critical both in business implications, statutory implications, environmental implications, will drive where you put the energy to try and optimise the asset life cycle plan. And that's just common sense, unlocking what any, the critical looks like is the key. It's different in rail, it's different in aviation, it's different in prisons, it's different in schools, but the answer there is there to be unlocked, and that's where we're heading. This diagram is showing that if you actually become more joined up and you think about this as a more integrated way, we understand that there will be renewals, 
there will be a cost relationship if you spend money on the asset, you expect the maintenance will therefore <coughs> drop. And at certain points in its life, the asset will start to get more expensive, so you may need to do a midlife um, overhaul. Sounds awful, that doesn't it? Uh, and then there's a certain point to which it's going to fall over. The risk and the failure consequences would say you need to intervene. We do not want a situation where plane falls out of the sky is a no no or a certain building would have impacts on the customer or cost some money because of not taking the right interventions. There are trigger points based upon understanding the profile and the life of the asset and how it relates to risk and how it relates to condition and how condition will inevitably decline. But one of the hardest things to win is the budget beyond the year ahead. And you've always got by hospital, schools, why would you give any more money? But the school's 40 years old, sir. But sorry, there is no more money, same as last year, less 20%. The hardest thing out there is winning the business case to invest in the asset in a more five-year planned way. I'm also observing quite regularly that clients are struggling, even when they win the budget, because it's annualised and short term, they struggle to spend the money because they don't have enough time to execute the works before they come round again. So taking a five-year view of assets and understanding the business relevance is helping people to plan programmes of work and make the spend best buy relevant to their operation and their business. And that's just really understanding the relationships and the balancing out of risks we condition with renewal and maintenance planning in a more joined up way. I've done some work with Network Rail, helped to write their asset policy last year, and they're very much around standardising the assets. We may be interested to know there's 206 asset types, and that's actually a virtual model, which is almost like a BIM model for, for stations. And those 206 asset types, what is the compliance to keep out of jail? What's the appropriate um, replacement cycle? And how do you make sure that you build this in a life cycle way? So escalators, how do you build, maintain, replace them and optimise the life cycle planning? Critical systems, relatively straightforward building types, but the actual principles hold true. You intervene on critical assets before they die, so you've got time to put them right, or you let certain non-critical assets run to failure is a simple strategy that optimises the running and maintaining of facilities. Okay. So uh, where we're going is, just want to also make a big jump now in the last five minutes I have, and show you a simple illustration of what we did about six, seven years ago, Reconstruction Excellence, around how to make the big leap to getting better value, not just best life cycle cost. I'm gonna do that because if you actually achieve this in the front of projects, you realise the biggest potential to make a value step rather than you're often doing a project and you've lost the opportunity because the thinking isn't wide enough. So I'm going to just say everybody in this room and everyone in this country knows exactly how to do this. We don't need loads of training, loads of standards, because it's really obvious. And I'll prove that in 10 seconds. Because when you go to buy your next house, you automatically, intuitively say, three bedroom house, this sort of character, in this location, I want it for this period of time, I've got so much money to spend. You provide the whole life value criteria and then, funny enough, you automatically sieve out 90% of the flyers that don't really meet your requirements. So screening in a whole life way is as simple as what you do when you go and consider buying a house. Once you've selected a few, funny enough, we go and see them, and we look at it in a functional way, and we compare and contrast in our minds, without any training, how to actually understand value. We like the layout, we like the look, we like the way it's been done in terms of kitchens, bathrooms, we have an understanding of how we could upgrade it and make a good return on our investment when we sell it on. We then start thinking about what's it going to cost to run it, poll tax, all the other costs. We just do that in an intuitive way and we compare our preferred option with some other options and we shortlist this down to the ones we really want to get serious about. However, before we commit to invest, we go into even more detail and then the wife tells you which one you're going to have. <laughs> And that's when it gets fun, and you obviously you give in politely, as you always have to. Um, but the reality is you ask even more detailed questions, and out of that you exercise value. So in life cycle terms, I've just made this much easier to relate to. We're defining what value means, we're screening the options we shouldn't be looking at, we're taking forward the short list to meet our requirements, and we're not just doing it on lowest purchase cost, or capital cost, or running cost. We're doing it on value parameters with a purpose that stakes this down. Mindful of time, time cost quality are universal drivers. The functionality, the impact, sustainability are also relevant. 
you ask the right questions, you can easily shortlist any project. It's exactly what we're doing on the Heathrow projects right now. We're screening out the options by knowing what questions to ask. And once we get down to the sensible options, we ask some more questions and we run it again. Once we get down to the option we want to really focus on, we ask even more detailed questions and we run it again. But we're doing it in a structured way that touches all the key drivers of functionality, quality, all the things that the government said we should be doing in their mandate on getting the optimum balance between cost, value and quality as well as sustainability considerations. A simple example of that to finish off is ask the right questions, assess how those options for scheme one compare, scheme two may have some pluses and minuses, scheme three may have some hot spots. You can take a value judgment on which ones you like best. If they meet your fundamental requirements, you're then into fine tuning or doing something about the things that you don't quite want to get at the moment where you can actually address some of the short, shortcomings. Putting that in simple value terms, benefits and sacrifices, not just costs, compared to the resource, which is money and time and being compliant, is another way of assessing value. Finally, therefore, just to show this coming alive, in 2006, with the help of the Construction Excellence, we just said, let's put a marker down on what value might look like for the schools programme at the time, and then assess any project against it. Does it meet or exceed, or does it actually fail? <clears throat> so that simple example showing we've got the scheme that we looked at, the functionality was better, the impact was better, and the quality was roughly there. Time-wise, they could do it quicker, but they couldn't afford it. Okay, let's just make that real. So we actually had a PFI market, 16 weeks, to design four schools for an organisation up north. And the architects and the design team proved they were really good at listening, great at doing schemes, and as you see, they created a scheme which was great, it met all the aspirations, but it couldn't have the money to do it. Now, without having to go at my own profession, QS has stepped in and cuss cut it, <laughs> or hair dried it, or whatever you want to call it, took out space, took out spec, they can still meet the essence of the functionality, the compliance, but the wow factor and what they really wanted as stakeholders was just lost. It wasn't the scheme they wanted. But, in, but they did it to get to a budget. So you can see value can be simply assessed in a more balanced way. And then ultimately, something a bit special happened in my last minute. People talked to each other. They collaborated. They realised you could play some sensitivity with a way of visualising it, as we've shown here which allowed them to put their best energy into, what do you really want? Can we perhaps fund some playing fields and other things from elsewhere? Can we create some areas we could build later? And we created a scheme which was transformational, collaborative, and met their aspirations, and you see, touched all the points on their target in terms of value. That's life cycle cost in, in practice. And that's just to sum up, why is it a good idea? The stakeholders clearly are driving this, not the great design or let's just take the costs out or all the other things. It is there to make sure we construct options before we waste too much time in designing the wrong solution. And we're there to help the stakeholders consult, and there are lots of stakeholders. In the airports, there's the people that run the airports, there's the engineering managers, there's the development managers, the airlines, there's about 20 stakeholder groups. If you don't engage them, you have a major nightmare trying to take work forward or spend money on assets. So it's important to be able to work with them and some trade-offs will never be happy. So from that, there's a way in which we can bring together, this is my point, a value approach, which is embedded in life cycle at its core, that isn't confused by we're not sure how to do cost and maintenance anymore, because the standards are now here. And value is the answer in a business relevant way. And if you do that, the business case becomes far more compelling, and it's much easier to win the argument, not you've only got last year's budget, less 20%. And it's so demoralizing to do great work, and then you put it up for funding, and it says, go away, I have no more money, bad luck. It doesn't work for me, you can't run airports on, the finance guy says no money. It has to be a business case driven approach. That helps, that's really just a, a appetizer of our whole life costing, is now I believe becoming central to the way in which we run UK PLC. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew, if you could stay there and take some questions. Um, thank you, Andrew. That was, uh, I think, a great overview, a uh, great keynote address on, uh, for me, the business drivers behind life cycle thinking at the end of the day. A uh, quick summary of practice and the standards behind it. Uh, and also how to actually go about assessing value over life cycle as well as cost. And I think the importance of communication between the people undertaking the assessment uh, as well as the client in terms of what they want. 
We have uh, a few minutes now for questions. I am the vice chairman of the HVCA Sounds Committee for my sins. Okay? We want to make them accessible. We want to make them customizable. We are creating functional example packs that you can download very cheaply. How do you best run a school? What's compliance look like? And what's critical maintenance in a school? We've done it for the whole of the prison service. We're doing it for where well, we started with network rail. We're doing it for the airports. We see that their functional models will help the market not just have a generic list of six, seven hundred assets they don't know which one to pick. Create a pack, you download, pick an office, pick a school, pick an office. That's where we're heading. Okay? That's making it easy. And we're deliberately making it transparent. What is go to jail maintenance? And why is it go to jail? Link it to all the legislations, 212 different reasons why you have to do maintenance. You know, solid on the boilers, 12 month inspection on boilers. That's where they move to. The website's been reinvented to make it more accessible. And yes, you do have to pay for it. But which school could not afford 50 quid to buy a book to help them manage it better? It's before that, it's in, in selecting the plan to go in the school. Exactly. You need to look at it at that time. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's bringing it backwards. So there's a number yeah. of initiatives, but I won't hog it. So. Okay. 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 Uh, further questions, please? Sorry. Um, and King, you said you asked lots of questions. Where do you find the gaps where people can't answer them? Well, I'm sure you don't get all of them answered. I know no. one of the issues around life cycle is where some of those gaps are, so I'm wondering yeah. if you'd like to think of you know, well, the, some the model we, The model we shared with you was actually built off of the DQI schools model, which already had structured questions for the sector <laughs> developed for functionality. It's covered in, in use, access, space, build, which is form and environmental construction and all of them, and impact. Those question sets were pretty comprehensive. What we felt with is you need to sieve them down to the ones relevant to the early stage screening and not overpower people. Also, which stakeholders want to answer which questions was a bit of a filtering we did. It wasn't we didn't ask the questions, it was more how do you work with the stakeholders on the right questions was the more appropriate use of the, the way in which we did that. Obviously when we went to Heathrow, the questions are different because they're worried about operating air bridges, not operating schools. The questions have been developed by the people that know how to run them and now they talk with their asset managers and maintenance team and we evolved the question set peculiar to the asset and its function. And that's how we've done it. And the audience have helped shape it. And have they been able to answer them? Well, in terms of I'm answering sure it, what do you mean by answer? Because the answer, the question is, how do you want it to function? How do you want it to perform in terms of its start in environmental uh, targets? How do you want it to be a, a cost effective? Are the, the prime questions which are universal? The answer is how well the option satisfies that is the appraisal of the application of a project or a piece of work. It's, it's looking at it in that different lenses is where we're at. Uh, just picking up on a question um, on, on your uh, comments made about um, the HVCA uh, document, um, SFG20. Um, document we, we're familiar with using has um, generic um, maintenance ta maintenance frequencies and tasks for, for various assets and, and it's, it's something that, that's been used widely in the industry for a long time. Um, and you mentioned that there's these, these packs available. Um, has, does it address um, the uniqueness of a building um, up, up uh, in, the, in the country and, and those that, that have different requirements in, in the middle of a city um, and are they, are they specific, um, for example, you, you know, one office building is very different to another in terms of its, of its environmental usage as well as um, uh, you know, others with specific applications like data centers and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, the simple answer is the core library is the basic spec one fit fits all. The two extra functionalities that they've made available is to pull the relevant asset specifications through into your library and you can edit it and customize it. <coughs> customize it means you could change the spec to be relevant to your building and your environmental needs, whether you do the frequency at the six monthly or 12 monthly, and why you do it in terms of its criticality or with color coding, is it red to keep out of jail or yellow because it's critical, green, nice to do. You have the flexibility to bespoke it to suit your building types. In process, over with a dedicated technical team, is how to evolve optimum functional specs to make them available, and there's more and more being developed, and over time they'll get tighter and tighter, to pre-package that answer, rather than you have to start cold and work it out for first principles. That's where they're heading. But it's now customizable standards, with a heads up as to what statutory means, by asset, by frequency, and the ability for you to personalize it as much as you want. 
but you take it out of the core so you, the integrity of the standards are maintained in a controlled environment, you do whatever you want to make it optimum for your facility, relevant to the parameters, environmental issues, etc. That's the ability that's now available from the, the 14th of November of last year. And the HVCA is now known as the B and ENS, for those who don't know. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much.